Spring claims that it is biodegradable and good for the environment. Voici Roundup, le premier des herbants biodégradables. Il détruit les mauvaises herbes de l'intérieur jusqu'aux racines et ne pollue ni la terre ni l'os de Rex. Roundup, le désherbant qui donne envie de désherber. Roundup biodegradable. Ken Cook was right. The company was found guilty of false advertising twice. The first time was in New York in 1996. And the second was in France just last year. The judges found that the wording biodegradable leaves the soil clean and respects the environment for false advertising. Especially since according to tests performed by Monsanto itself, only 2% of the product had broken down after 28 days. That's why Monsanto recently removed the word biodegradable from its containers. But that's not all. Many scientific studies have shown that Roundup is highly toxic. For example, Roundup provokes cell division dysfunction, a study by Professor Robert Bellet. Professor Bellet works for the National Center for Scientific Research and the Pierre and Marie Curie Institute in France. He has studied the effects of Roundup on fertilized sea urchin eggs. The big surprise was that Roundup has an effect on cell division. We saw very quickly that Roundup affected a key process in cell division. Not the cell division mechanisms themselves, but those which control cell division. You have to understand how cells become cancerous. In the beginning, all cells are benign, and then at a certain point, modifications take place in the cells that make them unstable from a genetic point of view. This is the first malfunction that we observed with Roundup. It is for that reason that we consider that Roundup provokes the first stages that lead to cancer. We're careful not to say it provokes cancer, because we won't see the cancers develop for 30 or 40 years. It was immediately clear how important these findings were for product users, especially since the tested doses were well below those which people normally use, and we said to ourselves, gosh, we really have to let the public know about the dangers as quickly as we can. And I thought the best way to do that was to talk to my administration. But there, I was shocked, very, very shocked, because I was told, ordered, rather, not to communicate our findings due to the GMO question lurking in the background. What an incredible account. Roundup's toxicity was hidden to protect the development of GMOs. So let's go back to the creation of GMOs. According to Monsanto's site, Roundup Ready soybeans, introduced in 1996, were the first bioengineered crop to be approved in the United States. Farmers using these seeds belong to the American Soybean Association, whose address is on Monsanto's site. John Hoffman is its vice president and an ardent biotechnology advocate. In the spring, I will go out and, and spray one pass of Roundup to burn down the weeds that are growing in the early spring. And about uh, six or seven weeks later, I'll spray a second pass of Roundup. And that controls the weeds for the year. Before we had Roundup technology, this field would have had weeds. We would have had to walk through and pull the excess weeds by hand. It was labor intensive. So the Roundup Ready system saves me time and it saves me money. It seems Monsanto's new wonder has what it takes to entice farmers. But how does it work? How can the soybean plants survive being sprayed with Roundup? This is a soybean cell. The core of this cell contains its DNA in which the bean's genetic structure is encoded. In order to create its GMOs, Monsanto breaks the species barrier using a Roundup-resistant gene harvested from a bacterium. This gene is placed on microscopic particles of gold, which are fired into the soybean cells with a gene gun. 
the gene penetrates the DNA and creates a protein, making the plant resistant to Roundup. When the herbicide is sprayed on the crop, it kills all the weeds, leaving the soybean plants intact. One must admit that the process is an incredible technological feat. But these soybeans engineered to withstand such a powerful herbicide are destined for our dinner plates. They must have been thoroughly tested before being put on the market. Who was the Secretary of Agriculture at the time? Dan Glickman, Bill Clinton's Ag Secretary from 1995 to 2000. What I found in the early years I was involved in the regula regulation of biotechnology that there was a general feeling in agribusiness and inside our government in the U.S. that if you weren't marching lockstep forward in favor of rapid approvals of biotech products, rapid approvals of GMO crops, then somehow you were anti-science and, and anti-progress. Well, I think that, frankly, there were a lot of folks in industrial agriculture who didn't want as much analysis as probably we should have had because they had made a huge amount of investments in the product. I mean, I think that, and, and certainly when I became secretary, given the fact that I was in charge of the department regulating agriculture, I had a lot of pressure on me not to push the issue too far, so to speak. But I, I would say even when I opened my mouth in the Clinton administration, I got slapped around a little bit by not only the industry, but also some of the people even in the administration. In fact, I made a speech once uh, where uh, saying that we needed to be more, we needed to more thoughtfully think through the regulatory issues on GMOs. And I had some people within the Clinton administration, particularly on, in the U.S. trade area, that were very upset with me. They said, how could you in agriculture be questioning our regulatory regime? In a nutshell, in the United States, the Secretary of Agriculture doesn't stand a chance against the multinationals. But just how are GMOs regulated in the United States? The most crucial policy on the subject was published by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, which is legally responsible for regulating the safety of food and medicine. Title, Foods Derived from New Plant Varieties. Date, May 29, 1992. Principle 1. Foods derived from genetic modification are regulated within the existing framework that applied to foods developed by traditional plant breeding. Obviously, the FDA decided not to create a special category for GMOs. For further information, contact James Mariansky, who headed the biotechnology department at the time. Basically, the government had taken a decision that it would not create new laws, that it felt there were already sufficient laws in place that had enough authority for the agencies to deal with new technologies. That means the White House asked the agency to write a policy where GMO should not be submitted to a specific regulatory regime, but it's not based on scientific data. It's a political decision? Yes, it was a political decision. It was a very 